Hombre. Now that would be hungry. I called you hombre. Hey, Maxine, the, just we need to identify who you are and where we are right now, uh, just for future reference. I know who you are, but whoever is looking at the tape might not. So give me your first name, your last name, and tell me where you're a missionary. I'm, Max <coughs> Grief. <coughs> I'm Maxine Stewart, and I served as a missionary in Thailand for 36 years. Go ahead and spell that for me, too. So the, the your Maxine Stewart. M A X I, my. I am doing a terrible. Can we start no, over? No, you're okay. This is just All for right. I identification okay. purposes. My name is Maxine Stewart, M A X I N E S T E W A R T. Okay, great. That's just for whoever might look okay. at the tape later on and use the footage. <clears throat> um, why don't we just go ahead and start by telling me a little bit about your childhood and, and uh, how you first, I guess, really learned about or or the concept of, of foreign missions or other people around the world, how, how all that came about. Okay. <clears throat> My family lived on a farm when I was a small child, and um, they were regular church attenders. We, had, we attended a quarter-time church. We had Sunday school every Sunday, but only had preaching services one weekend a month. We had it on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, my father was a deacon in the church there, and my mother taught a Sunday school class. And um, <clears throat> we didn't, we were not exposed to missions at that time. But uh, the Lord gave me a, a wonderful blessing in my youth. Uh, our church had Saturday night singings, and uh, not only my parents witnessed the fact but neighbors witnessed the facts that I hummed tunes before I could talk. And uh, I think this was being exposed to these uh, songs and worship services on uh, Sunday and then the Saturday night singing. <clears throat> also, I seem to have had a special gift for my hands on a musical instrument, which we did not have. I was 15 years old before my family had a musical instrument in the home. Um, when I was small, now a, friend, uh, a cousin told me this just two weeks ago. This farmhouse that we lived in at that time, there was one door that went on to a porch and there was a drop down to go down to the porch. And my father had put some boards across the door to keep me from crawling out or falling out. And um, he and his father, this cousin and his father were at our home one day and um, they saw me playing on one of these planks, one of these boards across the door. And I was going up and down like I was playing a piano. And uh, the pastor had been in our home that day and my cousin met him out in the yard and the pastor said to him, said, I've just been talking to a little missionary. Well, I didn't know uh, these details until after the Lord called me to be a missionary. But my mother shared with me after our call, after my call, that our pastor had, now he served four churches, <clears throat> being a quarter time situation. Uh, he had told my parents that in one of the other churches he was preaching about missions and he challenged the people to respond. And he said, who should come forward but his own daughter? And he said, while the congregation sang, he said, I stood there and talked her out of going to missions and told her it wasn't really her that God was calling. He was calling married couples so there would be a man to do the preaching and so on. Two weeks later, she died. And he told my parents, he said, I just want you to know that I'm praying that God will call Maxine. I never knew this until after I, I received the call to missions from the Lord. And I'm really glad I didn't know about it because it might somewhere along the way might have swayed me uh, to go ahead of the Lord's at some point. Um, I had struggled with this call because I really didn't want to be a missionary. 
I was 16 years old before I heard about missions. And um, it never occurred to me that our pastor had not preached on missions. But uh, we moved to a college town in Jacksonville, Alabama, and we attended the First Baptist Church, Jacksonville. And it was there that I was introduced to missions. I became a YWA member and I began to learn about missions and missionaries. It, it seems like um, a lot of that may have laid the groundwork, but in talking with y'all yesterday, which I, I didn't realize, um, see, it seems like the point at what, which you met Uncle Bob and y'all kind of developed your relationships and stuff, that that was a real crucial point at which God started working on your heart. It's, tell me a little bit about that time period and, and how uh, either other people or Uncle Bob or whatever the circumstances, what happened okay. to kind of put it on your heart about missions? Um, I attended that church for several years, and uh, one Sunday morning I met Bob Stewart from Nebraska in our Sunday school class. And as time moved on, Bob and I began to date. And while we were dating, we became quite serious. And he asked me one day, he said, what would you think if, about being a pastor's wife? Well, liking that man and loving him very much, I thought I could handle that. So I said, I, I think I, I could do that. And then he said, well, what if God called us to be missionaries? And I honestly did not think God would do that to me. So I said, well, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. And so, as time moved on, and Bob was pastoring churches, he pastored for almost 10 years before we went to Thailand, uh, he, devoured the, he devoured the mission publications, and he preached it from the pulpit along with the Bible teaching on missions. And I just knew, since he began preaching mission sermons about mid-November and all the way through December, I just knew it was going to be during one of those sermons that the Lord was going to get through to me. And I had three children, and if it got too, too touchy, too close, I would make sure that the children were okay, and I'd spend my time making them sit still or whatever just to get my mind uh, off of actually what he was talking about. Well, it wasn't there at all. Um, he was preparing for one of those Light and Moon sermons, and he called out to me. Now, he was in a past, he was pastor at Euliton Baptist Church, and he was in his study across the bedroom and said to me in the living room where I was, he said, Honey, I want you to sing a solo Sunday. Well, I didn't even pretend to be a soloist, and I thought he was teasing, and I said, Oh, really, what would you like for me to sing? And he didn't tell me the name of the song. He told me what number it was in the Broadman hymnal. Number 131, How Long Must We Wait? And uh, for some reason, I turned to the piano and I started playing and singing that song. And it was at that time that God got through to me. Nobody around, just me and God in the living room. And I couldn't believe it. My first impulse was to go in the study and tell Bob what had happened. But I thought it might be an uh, emotional effect this song was having on me. And I didn't think I could stand to see him hurt because we had I had consented for him to write the Foreign Mission Board at one point when we were down in Pineapple, Alabama, write for applications. And I was filling mine out, and it got to a question, do you know you have been called by God to be a missionary? So I had to go say to Bob, I can't fill this out. God has not called me. So this particular day, I was dressed to go to the grocery store when he asked me to sing that song. And um, I was so shaken up, I just jumped in the car and went to the grocery store. Now, you were out there this morning, and you know it's about a 10-minute drive from there back into town. And um, all the way to town, I just prayed out loud. And when I got to the grocery store, I thought, I hope I don't meet anybody I know. I don't want to talk. So I went in and got my groceries and pushed my card up to the cashier and realized I didn't have my purse, my money. Now, a normal person would have pushed the card aside and said to her, I'll be back in about 25 minutes. I've got to go get my money. Not me. I went back and I put all this stuff back on the shelf. 
And um, I went home and got my money and came back and got the groceries. And by then it was time to go to the week of prayer meeting. Well, we just had a wonderful program that afternoon and I wanted to tell those ladies so bad I was just about to die. But I wanted to tell Bob first, so I didn't get to say a thing about it. Well, I got home and as I drove in the driveway, Bob was coming out of the house putting his overcoat on. He had had one of those calls, preacher, can you come now? Some woman was in the chicken house threatening to blow her head off with a shotgun. And so I said to him as I met him there on the walk coming from the house, I said, honey, I want to talk to you. He said, well, I've got to go right now, but we'll talk when I get back. He got back about nine o'clock that night and I was sitting in the, at the dining table folding up baby diapers. Now I had made me out a list of 17 reasons why I could not be a missionary during those four and a half years that I had struggled with. He might call me and every time I could think of something really good that I could put on that list, I ran and added it to it. Well, I'd gotten that list out while Bob was going, and I went over every one of those items, and there wasn't a thing I couldn't check off, except my mother. I hadn't told mother yet. Now, I thought mother would just weep and wail if I told her I was going overseas. But when we went to tell her son on Sunday, she didn't shed a tear. And so Monday morning, she called, and she said, now, I've had my little cry now. I can talk. And that's when she told me about the pastor saying that he was praying that I would be, that the Lord would call me to be a missionary. And so I thanked her for not ever telling me about that beforehand. She said that morning, she said, we knew it was going to happen. We just didn't know when. So the Lord took care of her too. Not a thing on that list of 17 reasons could keep me from going. I'd put stupid things on there like, I couldn't fly. I'd been on a horse when I was little. And I could remember how my feet stuck straight out on that horseback. And I thought, as high up as I felt on that horse, if I felt that high accordingly in an airplane, there was no way I was getting in an airplane. And then I put, cannot fly on my list. And the fact that I can't swim, I thought, well, there's no, no use trying to sail. I can't even swim. As if that would make much difference out in the middle of the Pacific. Anyway, the Lord took care of all those reasons. And um, when I got to share with Bob that night, when he came home about 9 o'clock, I didn't have one little girl that I put on my list. I couldn't take my little girl. What if she got sick and we didn't have any doctors? I didn't realize we'd end up living at our mission hospital for five years. So I put this little girl on the list. But that night, as I sat there folding those diapers, I had three children to take care of now, not just one. I didn't have any qualms about taking those children overseas. And so the Lord had just done such a work in my heart and in my life that I knew that he would take care of anything that I was confronted with on the foreign mission field. You talked about the way the pastor prayed. Did, do you think that, uh, tell me what you think those things had as an effect on you becoming a missionary? And how did that nurture you to becoming? It, as I remember him he was uh, he had very poor eyesight by the time I had a memory of him and he actually became blind but he would still be our pastor and he lived in another community and my father would our family would meet him in Arab and take him out to the farm and he'd spend the weekend with us most every time he came he stayed in our house and I can remember sitting on his lap and I remember him hugging me and I remember him telling me he was praying for me. But I didn't know to the extent of what he was praying for. I cannot remember any, any conversation we had about my being a missionary uh, or him praying for me to this end. Uh, I loved him very much and even after he became blind and I began to grow up, he bought me some material for a dress to be made and so mother got a letter from the um, pastor's wife and she wanted to know how much material he bought which was not near enough to make me a dress in his mind I was still that little girl that he remembered seeing and I didn't grow in his thinking evidently so he just bought he told the lady that sold in the material he said she's just a little girl well I was a big girl by then but I can't remember a conversation about missions with this man. 
Tell but me. I know he prayed for me a lot, and um, I'm sure the Lord heard and honored his prayer. I, I credited Bob with it a long time. I said I, to him, I think if you'd ever quit praying for me, I wouldn't, God wouldn't have called me. But then when I found out about this pastor, somebody had been praying for me a long time. Tell me, getting back to Ulliton and the church there, tell me at that point, tell me first of all about the church and kind of what the church was like and tell me who was influential in in that building you up for the possibilities of missions. If that was Uncle Bob, then you know, just tell me that aspect. Of okay. That. As he served churches in that 10 year period, uh, I was a member of the WMU and worked with uh, young people in the YWAs. Now in Pineapple, Alabama, uh, we, had, um, we had four girls, four young people girls, and four young boys, young men. And there was no, no mission organization for the men. So we changed our name from YWA to YPA, Young People's or Auxiliary, and included the boys. And we had 100% attendance nearly every time we met. And uh, we studied missions, we had programs, we had dinners at our home, we invited um, missionaries like from, from Rachel Sims Missions in New Orleans. We had a lady come up and spend the weekend with us. We had uh, Lloyd Moon, who was a missionary in Brazil, to come. He spoke to the young people. And we used opportunities to try to inform them about missions. Now, I wasn't, um, I wasn't, um, uh, up in arms about not going myself at that time, but um, I guess I was working on my list at that time too because the Lord had already called Bob when he was a student in New Orleans Seminary. So when he um, left uh, Pine when we left Pineapple and came to Ulliton, uh, I worked with the YWAs uh, in Ulliton. We had about ten girls all together in Ulliton. And uh, we met usually at my house because of the children. And um, it was in the study of these programs. And then we lived neighbors with the president of the WMU. And I, that lady didn't know anything else to talk about. Evidently, she had seven children, but she, just, she was sold on missions. And um, we would talk about this. We got boxes of things together to send to the mission field. Uh, we rolled bandages. We made little baby dresses and sent to the mission field. And uh, Mildred was always um, sharing what she was planning for the WMU programs. And the Sunday that we told our church about my call, she said to us, she said, we've been knowing a long time y'all were going, we just wondered when y'all were going to find out about it. So uh, it came as no surprise to our church family, and I don't think it was altogether my dragging my feet. Um, I really believe, and it took me a while to figure this out, why didn't God call me when he called Bob? Bob came home and shared with me what happened, and I listened to him out, but I had nothing to share except that God had not called me. So, um, now what was I going to say? Um... When the Lord did call me, why did you I, call you yeah, why, I, I, yes, I was wondering why he didn't call me. Why go through this four and a half year of struggle? I even had a partial facial stroke, and the, the doctor said, you're upset about something. Well, he wanted to know if I could tell him what I was nervous about. Well, there's no way I was going to tell that doctor my struggle with this possibility that I might be a missionary. Anyway, he got my face straightened out, and, and um, I keep losing my train of thought on this. Are you oh, yeah. So in thinking about the children, I had an awful time during the three pregnancies just with my sense of smell, and uh, I couldn't keep food down. Just any odor, just boys sent me to the bathroom. And I, when I got to Thailand, Thailand's a very smelly country with all the shrimp paste and the squid and the duck farms and the fermenting tapioca. It's just a smelly country. 
Well, with those strong odors that you, you catch just even going down the main highway, I, I'm just not sure I could have handled a pregnancy over there. And I truly believe that the Lord let me have my family before we went. We took an eight-year-old daughter, a five-year-old daughter, and a 14-month-old son. And I think in his wisdom, he had me to wait until the family was well on its way before he called me. Tell me, you kind of transitioned nicely to Thailand. Um, tell me, looking back on all your years as a missionary in Thailand, tell me what, give me first the first part of when you got there and what it was like and, and that kind of thing. And then over the years, how how you guys became part of the, you know, people and that kind of thing. Tell me a little bit about that aspect of Thailand. When we went to Thailand, we lived in the capital city of Bangkok while we were in language school for a, the equivalent of a two-year study. But when Bob got his finished, which was about a year and a half, they let us move out to our assigned field of service. While we were living in Bangkok, I thought, now we'll take some photographs around the house and the neighborhood and send to my mother because mother just knew we were going to end up living in the jungle. So we took pictures and, and got them developed, got them back, and lo and behold, it did look like we lived in the jungle. I couldn't send the pictures because it would have verified mother's thinking. All the lush greenery there, you know, um, with the palm trees and the banana trees, it, it, it's beautiful to look at, but when you're trying to ease somebody's feeling about it, um, that's not, that wasn't really what we needed to do. So we lived there in Bangkok, and the heat was one of the things that really was um, uh, difficult to get used to. Now, when we stopped, we went by ship. It took three weeks to travel by ship, and then we, from California to uh, Hong Kong, and then we flew from Hong Kong to Bangkok. Well, while we were in Yokohama at the, uh, at the port, we received some mail, and there was a letter from the Thailand Baptist Mission uh, asking us to consider going to Chongqing Sao. Well, we couldn't even pronounce the name, you know, and we knew nothing about it, but by the time we got to Thailand, Chongqing Sao was just a part of our vocabulary. We were traveling on the ship with some friends who were returning to Thailand, so we took the letter to them, and they were very excited. They knew a lot about Chongqing Sao, so they shared with us what they knew. So, the letter also stated that they had hired a cook and a wash girl for us. And I looked at Bob and I said, whatever will I do with two girls in our house? I was not used to domestic help. And so we got to Thailand and this heat, man, it took us a while to learn to wear sweaty clothes. If we had a meeting at night and we went to language school in the morning, and sometimes we had an afternoon meeting, and having five members of the family, that's 15 rounds of clothes right there. And there was no way I could do the, the laundry and, and go to school and run the household. So I saw I couldn't do without this girl first Good week we were hand. there. She was washing by hand. We didn't have a washing machine or anything. And then uh, there were no supermarkets. And to, to go to the market to buy vegetables and fruit, you bargain for everything there. That's, that's something I never did learn to enjoy. I had to live with it, but I didn't like it. But I couldn't even speak the language. So I saw I couldn't do without the girl who was working in the kitchen because she would go and she would buy the, the food and um, she would bargain with the sellers to a reasonable price. So we saw right away we uh, could not do without either one of them. But then as time went on there, I lost my kitchen privileges, and I was a very frustrated missionary. Even our children didn't feel free to go to the refrigerator and get a drink of water because the cook would appear at the door and say, what do you want? I mean, that was her domain, and uh, it, even though it was our house, we were not supposed to, it seemed like we weren't supposed to overstep, overstep our boundaries. So I said to Bob, when we move to Chongqing South, I am not having a cook. Well, one of our co-workers, Polly Morris, found out about this, and she made three trips over to my house trying to persuade me to get a cook. She said, you're going to kill yourself. I said, I'd rather go that way than to go this way. So we moved to Chongqing Sao and got our house set up, 
and we had a nine room house and so we used one of the rooms right by the dining room for the school room because I was going to teach our children. And so we included home ec as part of their curriculum. Uh, they began by setting the table and Bobby was so little he had sort of tiptoe to see where to put the silverware but he took his week about in this. And then as uh, they learned to cook, uh, I got, I had an illness um, some in 64, 63, um, that the doctor put me to bed with, and Ruth Ann took over the kitchen. She had learned to cook enough that she could handle the kitchen part pretty well with her dad's help when he was home. He had a very heavy schedule being the area missionary and the only missionary in, the, in that province. So he wasn't home a great deal. But Ruth Ann would come up and sit by the bedside and we'd talk about recipes and she'd write them down in the book. And uh, she had her little notebook and so she would go down and fix the food. And uh, I was really glad then that we had included the kitchen part in our school curriculum. We uh, were struggling for ways to get the gospel before the Thai people. Uh, Bob being the area missionary, he was going out preaching. He was doing street preaching um, just in the middle of the street or, or street corners or under a shade tree or at boat landings or wherever people were gathered in the marketplace. And um, sometimes the children and I would go along and I'd play the accordion. And that would get the crowd together to come see what the music was. If I didn't go, Bob Bob put up a song sheet and a picture roll when we had Bible pictures and he'd put up his what we called his preaching roll and um, his song sheet and the Lord blessed him with a lot of volume so if we didn't go with the accordion he would just stand there and sing until the people would come to see what this foreign man was doing singing out there by himself. So uh, we would teach English in our in the church Everywhere we lived, we taught English, and um, also um, in our home. I could uh, handle, handle some English classes at our house when Bob would be out with the um, vehicle, the Lottie Moon van. And so we, anything that we could think of in ways to get the gospel before the people. Then we moved to, the, to Bangkok in the early 70s and we taught English at the Baptist Student Center. Bob was the director there. And um, I also worked with some Thai women who were married to American servicemen. And that was an English teaching program because most of those girls could not speak very much English at all. I wondered sometimes how they got it, engaged and married with their limited vocabulary. But that was one of the greatest challenges that came my way. I also worked at the Mission Hospital for eight years. I'm not medical, but uh, when you're a missionary, you become many things. Whatever the need is, if you can fill it, then you do it. And uh, we needed eight Thai nurses at our Mission Hospital, and we only had four. So our director of nurses, Rosemary Spesser, asked me if I could work in some time to give the girls so they could get some sleep and they were having to do two shifts and that's hard, hard work. So she told me she could teach me everything I needed to do, which she did and I wrote everything down. And the last day I left, uh, the day I left, I still had my notebook within reach of everything that I was supposed to do, like all the admissions, all the discharges, uh, ordering all the lab work, the medications, writing out medical cards, um, everything that had to be written, I, I did most of it. Tell, um, we're at for the nine. Okay. For the last. Let me change the. Time.